This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. In the world this week, China conducts its second underground nuclear test in three months. After being accused of links with drug barons, the Colombian president declares a state of emergency. In England, a unique tandoori restaurant proves it's a cut above the rest. And in Newsmakers Tonight, a new film that shows actor Keanu Reeves in a different light. Good evening and welcome to the world this week. The international outcry over China's latest nuclear test is yet to subside. Japan has already threatened to cut off aid to Beijing. But analysts say that while China's test shows how desperate it is to upgrade its nuclear arsenal before the comprehensive test ban comes into effect next year, Western nations critical of China have little to be proud of. India and China had much to discuss at the eighth round of talks on troop reductions along the Himalayan frontier. The talks were held only 24 hours after Beijing conducted its 43rd nuclear test at its Lop Nor testing ground in northwest China. Indian scientists estimated the force of the blast at between 50 and 100 kilotons. In, uh, India's concern about China's nuclear test may not have surprised the Chinese delegation, but the international reaction would certainly have. The US, which no longer conducts nuclear tests, was the first to criticize it. Three, two, According to analysts, one, the US has little moral right to attack China. The U.S. has conducted more than a thousand tests since 1945 and has massed enough data to simulate similar tests in the laboratory. The other strong reaction was from Japan. As the only nation to have been atom-bombed, Japan has never questioned the American doctrine that nuclear weapons are useful instruments of national policy. Australia's criticism of the test also lacked sincerity. Prime Minister Paul Keating's government supports the discriminatory non-proliferation treaty which divides the world into nuclear haves and have-nots. As long as Australia and Japan are not willing to push for the larger goal of abolition of nuclear weapons, attacking France and China alone uh, becomes a narrow political game rather than a serious uh, uh, disarmament initiative. Western powers backed by the US also want to finalize the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, CTBT, by next year. Here too, the aim is not disarmament, but to preserve the technological edge that the US now enjoys over the rest of the world. Many in the US today see the CTBT as an instrument of non-proliferation, of a treaty that would curb the ability of so-called threshold states like India, Israel and Pakistan. Uh, from testing nuclear weapons and improving their ability to build nuclear weapons in the future. Experts say that while India has consistently supported the CTBT, it should think twice before it signs the treaty, unless there is a credible guarantee that it will achieve total nuclear disarmament. The World Bank recently cancelled plans to fund a major dam project in Nepal. While the bank has cited a financial crunch and escalating costs as the reason for its withdrawal, Nepalese feel it was internal politics that led to the final cancellation. Since its inception 10 years ago, the Arun 3 dam project has been targeted by environmentalist groups. They say construction of the dam would destroy one of the few pristine forests left in the Himalayas. And the 450,000 people living in the valley basin would be displaced. However, Arun 3 lobbyists said the project would not only have provided electricity at cheap rates, but also develop the area and link the valley to the rest of the country. It was not long before it became a political issue. While it was in the opposition, the United Marxist-Leninist Communist Party fought vigorously against Arun 3. And last year, when the World Bank was about to approve the project, the deputy leader of the UML, Madhav Nepal, asked the World Bank to postpone its decision until after the general elections, which were held in November. 
the World Bank complied and unexpectedly this month it decided to withdraw its funds from the project. You need a strong political commitment on the part of the government which I think the present UML government didn't display. Even after they came to power, they did the dally on the, on the project. They took a decision in favor of the project. The international community also were a little worried about the strong commitment on the part of the government. But the UML government denies this charge and reports from Kathmandu say one of the major donors, Germany, has pulled out of the project, leaving the World Bank with no other alternative but to withdraw its support. In the last 10 years, the project itself has been scaled down from 402 megawatts at a cost of $764 million to the present 201 megawatts, while the cost has escalated sharply to $1.82 billion. Officially, according to the press release of World Bank, uh, there are uh, some uh, reasons are given there. Uh, it seems that uh, the technical, managerial, uh, financial uh, and uh, to some extent environmental and uh, also um, uh, the institutional infrastructure that has to be developed. But the opposition Nepali Congress claims the World Bank decision was influenced by the so-called populist economic policies of the communist government. You need to have a macroeconomic stability, otherwise you can't afford to you know, start this project, which involves a lot of balancing work, balancing in terms of revenue and expenditure of the government, controlling the expenditure and all that. General elections are again round the corner in Nepal and observers say the Arun Sri is sure to become one of the major campaign issues. In South America, Colombia's experiment with democracy may prove to be short-lived. President Ernesto Samper has declared a state of emergency and opposition leaders who claim he partly funded his election campaign with money from drug barons say he's trying to suppress the evidence. Colombia has had a long history of violence. If it's drug barons one day, it's left-wing guerrillas the next. So when President Ernesto Samper announced on nationwide television that 20,000 people had died in various acts of violence this year, few Colombians were surprised. But Samper's remedy for the violence surprised and shocked many Colombians. Assuming wide-ranging powers, the president declared a state of emergency for 90 days. My constitutional duty to seek peace is as clear and as firm as that of maintaining order. Opposition politicians reacted with anger. They claim Samper is trying to put the lid on a political scandal that may see him out of office. Ever since his election last year, Samper has been dogged by accusations that Colombia's infamous drug barons partly financed his campaign for the presidency. The Colombian media has been reporting secret testimony that Samper's former campaign manager and defense minister, Fernando Botero, took six million dollars from the Cali cartel, the world's biggest cocaine traffickers. Botero has denied that he took the money knowingly, but he was arrested on Tuesday and many Colombians believe their president could be involved. No necesito que ninguna persona al margen de la ley cuestione o certifique mi honestidad porque el pueblo colombiano ya sabe que tiene al frente de sus destinos a un presidente honesto. In fact, Samper's critics say the president's emergency powers will enable him to suppress information about his indiscretions. The president's coalition partners have decided to stick with Samper for the time being. But the real test of Samper's intentions will come after 90 days. If the emergency is extended, Colombians will have an authoritarian president apart from drug barons and left-wing guerrillas to worry about. Since last year's massacre, the Central African Republic of Rwanda has been relatively peaceful. But it could be the calm before the storm. There are reports that rebel Hutu tribesmen are preparing for an invasion and the United Nations has now lifted the arms embargo against Rwanda. There is trouble brewing among more than a million Hutu tribesmen living in the squalid refugee camps along Zaid's border with Rwanda. Human rights monitors claim stocks of ammunition and grenades have been positioned at a camp in North Kivu and assault weapons at a refugee camp in Bukavu. Mars! 
Reports say that 50,000 Hutus are being trained secretly in jungle camps and preparing for an invasion of Rwanda. To General Paul Kagame, Vice President of the Tutsi-dominated government in the Rwandan capital Kigali, these are not rumours, they are facts and they coincide with an increase in cross-border attacks. The UN tried and failed to station observers on the border with Zaid and Tanzania. And analysts believe this is what prompted the Security Council to lift the arms embargo against Rwanda on Thursday. Fears are now growing that the Hutu-Tutsi tribal conflict could engulf the whole region. According to analysts, an invasion is most likely from Zaid, where the biggest refugee camps are located, and also from Tanzania. Uganda, the other neighbour, is friendly to Rwanda's Tutsis and could intervene on their behalf in the event of a conflict. The biggest impact, however, would be on Burundi, which shares the same explosive mix of Hutus and Tutsis as Rwanda. Half a million people, mostly Tutsis, died in Rwanda last year when the Hutu government launched a campaign of genocide against them. Although the Tutsis defeated the Hutus in the civil war last year, they are still fewer in numbers. Analysts say General Kagame may carry out a preemptive attack on the refugee camps to prevent an invasion. Either way, Rwanda seems headed for a replay of last year's massacres that shocked the world. Negotiations for Israel's withdrawal from the occupied Arab territories have been painfully slow. But analysts say the dispute over the region's limited water resources could further complicate the process and will be the true test of Israel's sincerity in negotiating peace with the Arabs. He'd been shot in the chest by a Jewish settler. Another Palestinian casualty in the bitter struggle for their ancestral land. The militancy of the settlers is threatening to undo the limited gains negotiated by the Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, and Israel in expanding self-rule for the Arabs in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. We cannot live with two authorities in Israel, the government on one hand and the settlers in the, uh, uh, on the other. The settlers' stubborn refusal to leave their settlements and what is clearly Arab land is not just rooted in their perception of history. It's also rooted in the need for water in a traditionally water-scarce region. The Jewish settlers have monopolized underground water sources in the West Bank and are not willing to share it with the local Palestinian population. As a result, 120,000 settlers consume 60 million cubic meters of water every year. In contrast, one and a half million Palestinians get only 137 million cubic meters of water. Wealthy Arabs are known to pay as much as $50 to private contractors for water, 15 times the cost of water supplied by the municipal authorities. Since 1967, the Israelis have not allowed Arabs to drill more wells to draw water. Foreign Minister Shimon Peres recently proposed to increase the Arab quota by 35 million cubic meters. But the Palestinians have rejected the offer as blatantly inadequate. Water has also come in the way of an agreement on Israel's withdrawal from Syria's Golan Heights. Water from the Golan provides Israel with 30% of its drinking water and right-wing Israeli politicians are leading a nationwide campaign against returning the Golan to Syria. Some Israeli economists have suggested creating a regional water market to solve the problem. But Palestinian water experts say this will only ensure that water goes to those who can afford to pay, in this case, the Israelis. If the Israeli government does not address the problem of water sharing seriously, no agreement with the PLO will bring peace to the region. Fifty years after the Second World War, Japan has finally used the word apology while remembering its role in the war. But many who suffered at the hand of the Japanese militarists claim Japan really doesn't have any regrets. For both the victors and the vanquished, the 50th anniversary of the end of the Second World War in the Pacific was a big occasion. It was a time for remembrance for the victorious Allied war veterans in Yokohama.
Thousands of their comrades had died in the fighting in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, and many remembered the humiliation they underwent in Japanese prisoner of war camps. For the Japanese too, the war was a painful experience. It is the only country in the world to suffer devastation caused by nuclear bombs. After a week of remembering the nuclear holocaust in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Japanese honored the war dead this week. And before the ceremony, Prime Minister Tomichi Muriyama expressed what has been called the strongest statement of contrition from a Japanese official. I regard in a spirit of humility the irrefutable fact of history and express here once again my feelings of deep remorse and state my heartfelt apology. But almost at the same time Murayama was making his apology, half his cabinet was at the Yasukuni shrine, honoring seven executed war criminals and the three million war dead. And some observers were taken aback by the remarks of a minister in his cabinet who said, in an era when most people know nothing about the war, is it really right to keep bringing up the past and apologizing in detail? China reacted strongly to that statement and South Korea said that while the Prime Minister's apology was positive, there were many in Japan who failed to take a correct attitude to the war period. Experts say the difference between Germany and Japan to their war guilt is most visible in their textbooks and in the money they paid as damages. Japan has refused to pay war damages unlike Germany, which has paid more than a hundred billion dollars in war compensation. And apology or no apology, Murayama made it clear there was no question of Japan paying compensation to those who suffered under its colonial rule in Asia. It's an eating joint that's miles above the rest. An Indian cuisine restaurant in England now delivers food by airplane to any location in the world. It could be just the average local Indian food restaurant in England. Except it isn't. Right from its unusual name to the decor, the eye of the tiger tries hard to be different. And it is, thanks to its new trademark takeaway service that delivers food by air. You could call it curry in a hurry. The idea took flight three years ago when a Bangladeshi pilot teamed up with some Brits to launch the world's first Indian flying restaurant. And the concept soon took wings. That we received a, a contract to supply uh, pop stars. It, our Indian cuisine was recognized by a company called Island Records. Uh, they're based in London and they asked whether we would consider um, or organizing delivery uh, for pop stars and celebrities. Those who could afford it soon developed a taste for it and the clientele now reads like a who's who. Well, David Gilmour of Pink Floyd, uh, we've delivered to Chakademus Empires, as you know, Aswad, Soul to Soul, Musical Youth, and also uh, Rod Stewart, Cliff Richards. We, we tend to be popular amongst the British celebrities, so we've uh, been involved in catering for John Major's 50th birthday. <laughs> And the restaurant is gaining international fame with customers ordering from far and away. We deliver to places like New York, Los Angeles. The furthest was uh, Yamba in New South Wales, Australia. And there's more to come. Um, we uh, uh, are working on a project known as the Indian Flying Restaurant, where we've actually started to convert a Boeing 707 into a restaurant and it should start flying from next year. And it looks like this is one flight that won't have any complaints about the food. But India won't be our route. We can't deliver a takeaway to India. We have so much respect for the true chefs out in India. India almost wishes they didn't. The Pankar De Sarkar in Burnworth for the world this week. And in Newsmakers tonight, singer Joan Armour Trading's new album has all her old trademarks. Actor Keanu Reeves gets to try his hand at something new. But first, Japan's best known siblings who are over a hundred and still going strong. Japan's famous twins, 
turned a youthful 103 last week amid celebrations organized by their numerous fans. Kim and Jin sent their message of thanks. On their birthday, the twins had a tight schedule. They made a trip to Sado Island, where a party was hosted for them by the people. They also inaugurated a stone monument with imprints of their hands. Later, it was time to enjoy sumo wrestling by the sea. For a century, the twins had lived in obscurity, till the media discovered them on their 100th birthday celebrations. The two then became a runaway success story, when the advertising industry signed them up. And now, Japan can't seem to get enough of them using them not just to deliver commercial messages, but as icons of healthy living. Hollywood heartthrob Keanu Reeves gets his first romantic lead in A Walk in the Clouds, released in the U.S. last week. Spanish actress Aitana sanchez Gijon and Anthony Quinn co-star. Reeves plays a G.I. who has a chance encounter with the daughter of a vineyard owner. You're waiting for a ride. No. No. A miracle. <laughs> He's going to kill me. Well, I don't know your father, but I don't think that just because something... I'm left. pregnant. Yeah, it, it certainly has all the uh, uh, classical signifiers. But, um, um, but there is... But there's some cool... You know, her, you know, meeting the G.I. falling in love with the woman who's, you know, with child, with no husband, and that kind of, a woman trying to gain her independence, and, and yet being pulled in by the traditional. I mean, uh, I thought it was very, it's, it's very, um, not very, but it's sophisticated, and it's, uh, 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 that's what I liked about it. The film is directed by Alfonso Arau, whose last film, Like Water for Chocolate, became the highest grossing foreign film in the U.S. When the story starts, she's very, she's very vulnerable. But at the same time, she's strong and she's learning how to be strong. I want the truth. That's what I want. No, you don't. The only truth you want is the truth according to you. That's the only truth you can accept. Try me. Joan Armatrading, who sang her way into the charts with tender ballads, is back with a new personal album, What's Inside. Last week, Armatrading launched a concert tour in Johannesburg. Well, I've never met anyone with your courage. It is a little bit like the old, older things, but it's it's um, it's new all the same time. You know, it's different. It's not me just going back and re rehashing any, anything. Uh, so I hope people will go out and buy it and enjoy it because it's. It, I, I think it's one of the best albums I've done. when people use the songs to communicate to people and I like it if the song communicates a feeling to people that maybe they didn't quite know how to express themselves you know as bright as the sky 
That's the way the world was this week. We'll see you again next Sunday at the same time. Till then, have a great week ahead. Good night.